this session is sales. We're going to follow the same format. It is deceptively simple, as I said, but don't underestimate the power of the repetition, 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 repetition. If you, if you just keep doing this and stay focused, I promise you, you will, you, will, you will leave here tomorrow with an action plan that will transform your whole business in 2021, this year, and set you up for a mind-blowing 2022. All right. So, same questions, same order. What are some things that the pandemic forced you to start doing, allowed you to start doing, uh, <clears throat> created an opportunity that didn't exist before so you could start doing? What are some things the pandemic forced you to stop doing that you now realize you, the things you want to, that you were, that you started doing that you realize now that even after the pandemic is, 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 is behind us, you realize, wow, I started doing it because of the pandemic, but I want to keep doing it. Uh, the pandemic forced me to stop doing it, but now I realize I never should have done it in the first place, or I should have stopped doing it a long time ago. After the pandemic is, is, is behind us, I don't want to go back to doing it. I want to keep not doing it. Um, and three ways that the pandemic actually made your business better. And then um, in terms of sales, this one is focusing just on sales. We're not talking about marketing. We're not talking about staffing. We're not talking about financial controls. We're just staying very focused on sales for this, for this session. And then, of course, last and not least is um, five problems that the pandemic has caused for your law firm that you still can't figure out how to turn that problem into an opportunity. And then you go to the mic and you share one or two things you started doing, one or two things you stopped doing, uh, a couple of ways maybe your law firm is now better because of the pandemic. Um, and then because you share with everyone, that's your pay it forward, and then I'll help you and we'll, we'll work together to help you figure out where the opportunity might be hidden in a problem that you're still struggling with for your law firm. Got it? Now, before we get to this, we're about to go to... Oh, so I'm going to go first. Um, with regard to sales, uh, the pandemic forced us to start selling virtual workshops. Before the pandemic, the idea had been floated, why don't we offer some virtual workshops? And I said, I don't think it's going to work. And more to the point, I don't want to do virtual workshops. And the pandemic forced us to start doing virtual workshops. And I discovered, just like, what's that commercial with the kid who doesn't like it, doesn't like the food? Mikey, my, oh, Mikey likes it. Turns out, Arjun likes doing virtual workshops, even though for years he said, I don't want to do virtual workshops. Um, actually, myself personally, I don't like virtu doing virtual workshops, but what I do like is calling uh, uh, Nicole and her saying, I can't talk today. I'm running a virtual workshop. And I say, what do you mean? And she said, oh, we marketed, sold, worked with the events team to organize, and I'm on day two of a three-day virtual workshop, and you're going to make some extra money. I like that. So I like virtual workshops now. Forced me to learn to like virtual workshops. Um, hired more salespeople. This is a really interesting thing the pandemic forced us to start doing, which is no exaggeration, probably going to quadruple my personal income in the next four or five years. And that's saying a lot. 
all right? Um, so the pandemic, what we've discovered is that selling virtual workshops in a pandemic type of world, our conversion rate has not necessarily changed very much. What has changed is the number of touches it takes to convert that prospect. Does everyone understand the two different KPIs that we track? Right, one KPI is out of a bot, out of a group of let's say, uh, let's just say ten prospects, you get three who eventually become a member. That's one KPI. The other KPI is it takes one touch for the person to become a member versus it takes three touches for the person to become a member, right? So let's assume the conversion rate stays the same, which it basically has, and let's just call it one out of three. So to get three new members required 10 touches. Touch one, no. Touch two, no. Three, four, five, six, no. Seven, eight, nine, or eight, nine, and 10. Yes, yes, yes. 10 touches, three new members. Got it? What the pandemic did to our business, we just discovered, is we got the same conversion rate, three out of 10, but now it takes 30 touches. It takes three times more touches for us. I'm not saying that's your experience, that's just been our experience. So what that means is that one salesperson can't handle as many sales as they could before when you could get the same conversion rate out of fewer touches. Is everyone following what's going on here? So what this forced us to do was to hire more salespeople. Now the thing that's really cool, watch how this just explodes into money for me. Transformational, generational transformational money that was forced upon us by what I'm about to describe. Because the pandemic now requires more touches, or required us more touches, we were forced to hire more salespeople. Because we were forced to hire more salespeople, we had to actually build a professional sales machine. Whereas before, we were kind of like getting along with like a little homegrown sales machine. You get what I'm saying here? All right, so the director of sales from Dan Kennedy's organization. Does anyone know who Dan Kennedy is? All right, well, if you knew who Dan Kennedy was, you'd be really impressed when I tell you that the director of sales for that organization now works for us. Holy fuck is the correct response to that, right? Now, had we not been forced to hire a bunch more salespeople, we wouldn't have been forced to look for someone of that caliber. And had we not been forced to hire a bunch more salespeople and now sell virtual stuff, which is much, much more scalable, he never would have been interested in come work for us. Except now what he's saying is, hey, I'm not really interested in coming in and hire and managing your four salespeople. I want to hire and manage 20 salespeople. You got to give me something that I can sell with 20 salespeople. Well, good news. We've got all this digital stuff that we've created because of the pandemic. So you see this pandemic has just forced us like into this much, much bigger opportunity. Y'all get what I'm saying here? I'm giving this as an example how, how the pandemic forced you, in, you know, got us to start doing things and one thing leads to the next. Um, the pandemic Okay, the, 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 the four-week virtual boot camp. Who came through the four-week virtual boot camp? Anyone? Okay, the four-week virtual boot camp is a beautiful thing. I mean, it's so much better than the way we used to do things. It's less expensive. It converts better. It requires less of my time. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And we used to treat it like... We just treated it like a second-class citizen. We never the the way we used to sell with a discovery day and bring people to a live discovery day. It worked really well. We built the business to fourteen million dollars doing it that way. If it ain't broke, why fix it? The pandemic came along and broke it, 
and forced us to really focus on using the virtual four-week boot camp, and now it is our new front entrance. Okay, so it forced us to start doing sales that way, and now and when the pandemic is over, we want to keep doing it that way. Um, the pandemic forced us to relaunch our digital membership program. We actually used to have a digital membership program. We built it, we sold it, it worked real well, we made some money with it, and then we shut it down because it wasn't worth it to us to keep giving it the resources that it needed to grow. And so we shut it down and we thought, oh yeah, one of these days we'll get around to it. Well, the pandemic came along and forced us to make that a priority again. And now that we've made it a priority again, hot damn, Dan Kennedy organization, former sales guy, now has what to sell with his team of salespeople. You see how this is all coming full circle, right? Um, some things that uh, the pandemic forced us to stop doing. Uh, it forced us to stop enrolling new members only at live events, only at live quarterly meetings, discovery days, the whole thing I just talked about, the virtual four-week boot camp. Um, It forced us to stop giving people, it forced us to stop offering memberships only to people who have already had a taste of what we do by coming to a discovery day and attending a live quarterly meeting and meeting all of our members. We now allow people to enroll in digital membership cold and use that as a way to kind of like, they get to know us, we get to know them, which is another way of saying it forced us to start treating prospects like members much, much earlier in the relationship. All right, so the lesson here for all of you is the earlier you can start treating your prospective new clients as if they were already clients, you smooth out that glide path and it, you lubricate it, you smooth it out, it just works so much better. And the pandemic forced us to finally start doing that. Even though we already knew we should have done it a long time ago, it forced us to start doing that. So when you're doing these exercises, I don't want you to limit your thinking to only the things that the pandemic finally made you aware of. There's certain things that the pandemic created the opportunity. There's certain things the pandemic finally made you aware of the opportunity. And for most of us, I think what, we're gonna what you're going to find if you're really being honest with yourself, I had to be honest with myself, is the pandemic it was mostly stuff that I prior, pretty much already knew I should have done or knew I was ready to, I should have stopped doing. And the pandemic just finally forced me to do it or stop doing it. You all get the idea? All right. Um, and then I could go on and on, but you get the idea, right? Okay, so um, and then some of the problems that the pandemic has caused that we still haven't figured out a solution for. Uh, the number one problem is the pandemic has become a really convenient excuse for people to use of, oh, well, you know, I definitely want to work with you guys, but, you know, after the pandemic, I mean, what are you going to say, right? Um, it, it's like, you know, we just haven't figured out how to solve that problem. I wish someone could tell me. That'd be great. Um, And then we, we pivoted and we experimented with some things and we tried some things that worked really, really great on the front end. They were very expedient. 
and they solved a lot of cash flow problems for us, or they prevented a lot of cash flow problems for us on the beginning end, uh, we sold the six month, we took, we, we, we started selling a six month membership to people who had not had the opportunity to come to a discovery day, right? But then what we found out is it sucked up a tremendous amount of the team's time and energy following up with those people at the end of six months to get them to sign an 18-month contract. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't anticipate that it would last that long, and we figured, oh, six months from now, we'll get them to a discovery day. It'll be great in October. Well, we couldn't do that, right? Um, so there, right? That's the exercise. I'm going to give you 10 minutes on the clock. Do it yourself. And then we'll go to the microphone. Which microphone did you use last time? Okay, we'll go to the microphone, and then we'll have about an hour, and you'll bring a problem, and I'll ask you to just share something. I'll ask you to share something you started. I'll ask you to share something you stopped, um, just to, so, you, so you share something with the room, and then you know, ask me the problem that you still haven't found a solution for, and I'll try to help you find a solution for that problem and if you stump me, then we'll just go to your next biggest problem and maybe I can solve that one. All right? All right. Um, questions? Francisco. Uh, Francisco Cervant. Um, just the problem, right? You don't need me to go through. Well, problems. just briefly, Keystone, estate planning firm, yeah, so used to gross this, now grosses that. We're in Chandler, Arizona. We do estate planning and probate. And um, 2020, we finished just a little over 1.5 million. Um, have nine employees, I think. Like I think nine employees. Um, you what? Have nine employees. And then what would, would you say after that? Mm, I'm trying to think of what else you want me to say. Okay. And, and the growth over the last few years, just so people can kind of get an idea the of the trajectory. Last few years have been kind of weird. We've been we were 1.5 the, this. In 2020, 1.3, 1.2. So the last few years, kind of the growth has been about that rate. The year before that was 850. The year before that, 750. The year before that was like 420, 310, 205. So two, three, four, seven, one ish, one ish, one ish, one ish. One and a half, yeah. Got it. Okay. What's the question? My question is, one of the oh, things... Oh, sorry. Something the pandemic forced you to start doing okay. with sales, stop doing with sales. Yeah, so this is right along, right up to my question. The thing that, it, one of the things that forced me to finally get around and doing was offering a, um, a more budget entry level estate planning package that could be a more of a volume play and also a um, uh, kind of like your four week boot camp, a complete do it yourself, super inexpensive automated estate plan. Okay, forced you to start doing that. So it forced me to start doing that. And, and even after the pandemic is behind you, you realize, wow, we should keep doing that. Yes. Good, okay, and what's something that forced you to stop doing? Um, forced us to stop doing in-person consultations. And you'll continue to not do in-person consultations or you'll just continue to not necessarily be dependent on them? Mm, probably the latter. Okay. And then three ways the pandemic's actually improved our firm. Uh, we are doing more consults. Our number of consults is up pandemic has also uh, required me to step back into sales full time, which has let me uh, really dive deep into the process, rebuild the script, and rebuild the process itself. So the goal isn't to keep doing all the sales yourself, no. but to keep, but, but you were going to continue to dive in and spot check from time to time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the new process, which is better and simpler, uh, is, and then the other, the third thing that I improved is that it's proven that um, it's going to just be easier for us to train 
new salespeople. Okay, so what's the question? Question is with the, with the, um, what we're calling a digital service, like this completely automated state plan, um, I, I, it's kind of a two-part question. I want to use that as an entry for, you know, some of our marketing sources without diluting our higher level services, you know, the, the actual, you know, white glove estate planning that we do. But I also want to build that just as its own revenue line item. And, and I don't have experience selling or building that funnel, I guess. Um, what's the name of that book that Dan Kennedy just wrote? Um, Almost Alchemy by Dan Kennedy. And there's a chapter in that book that talks about ascension plans. Yeah. And if you can get a copy of the recording from the last live Dan Kennedy conference, I actually was asked to speak on stage about that chapter of that book, about ascension plans. Um, what you're talking about is really an ascension plan. How do you ascend people from the low level to the high level? Um, If you, if you have enough people at the low level, first of all, maybe just from a cash flow standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. Strictly from a cash flow standpoint, would you rather have a thousand people paying you $200 a month or a hundred people paying you $2,000 a month? From a cash flow standpoint, it's probably about the same. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. And assuming that your, that your cost of goods sold, or assuming that your margins are the same, then you're really sort of indifferent. I mean, our margins would be higher on this lower product, but yeah. So yeah. my point is, if your margins are higher on the lower product, then maybe we're more interested in selling a lot of the lower product, and then the higher product is no longer your bread and butter, that just becomes like the premium VIP thing for you. And, and yes, that's, that's definitely been a thought. Okay, so, the, so your question is, how do you sell the low level thing without it eroding sales from your high level thing? Is that mm -hmm. the gist yeah, of your question? Pretty much. I, I mean, it's, it's that, but it's also, I feel like the, the marketing, I guess that maybe this is more of a marketing question, but I put it down as the problem is selling these digital project products, just in and of itself, selling those things at volume. I have, you know, I'm totally inexperienced there. Right. Um, it, it's, it's a mass media marketing play okay. as opposed to what you've been doing up till now, which is selling professional services. So you're really going to learn how to sell info products rather than professional services. So there's a difference. Yep. Um, yep. Let me just tell you exactly what to do. Okay. I was thinking about like turning this into a lesson and I realized it's a workshop. I don't have time for a workshop. So I'll just boil it down and tell you this is what I think you should do. I've done this myself. Uh, one, you should be putting out videos of yourself talking about this stuff every single day for 90 days. Right. Just a barrage of videos. Talking about the problems, talking about the opportunities, 
Uh, Larry King just died. His whole estate plan is a mess. Talk about that. Just you're out there. Like, remember I did the symposium at the beginning of the pandemic, and I was just like, I mean, I was on Zoom six hours a day, six days a week for a month and a half. I mean, it was brutal. I'm not saying you go to that extreme, but just start putting your message out there, okay? okay? Take those videos, uh, put them on TikTok, put them on FaceTime Live, put them on YouTube, put them everywhere. You can hire someone from something like Get Staffed Up, and they can take them and put them into all the right places for you if you set those channels up for them. Yeah, okay. And, and, and make step-by-step -step instructions to follow, okay? As you begin building an audience, you'll invite them to ask you questions. Their questions will give you content for the next videos. Mm -hmm. As you begin to engage them and ask them, invite them to ask you questions, it will start to inform what your videos are about and eventually what you will discover. I don't know when you're going to discover this, but you will discover this. What you will eventually discover is that there is demand for more information about something. And you'll say, we've had a lot of demand for more information about this thing. And so you organize a webinar or a teleseminar. And so you start to ascend people up from watching your free stuff to signing up for a webinar or a teleseminar or stuff like that. And then you essentially will do a teleseminar where you will sell the digital free, uh, the, the digital thing. Does that make sense what I'm describing here? Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the rewards that you'll be able to buy in our member referral rewards program, by the way, will be the opportunity for me to basically write and produce your whole webinar for you and then I'll interview you on the webinar and I'll just make the fucking sale for you. And I'm pretty good at doing that. I don't remember how many points that will take. It won't be a few. Good. You have to do a lot of good stuff for yourself and others and me and then that'll be one of the rewards that I will, I will provide for you. But that's how you do it. Now there's a million things you can do to make that better, mm -hmm. there's courses you can take, there's books you can read. I have attended more seminars and workshops and hired more coaches to teach me how to do this, to learn this craft, and I'm still learning it, and I'm still working on it, and you know, the day I die, I'll say I can't get any better at it, right? Because I'm, I'm always working on it. Uh, so the number one thing that I would tell you is don't judge your beginning by someone else's middle. Mm -hmm. Your first one will be bad. It just will. Your third one will make your first one look terrible. Mm -hmm. Your tenth one will make your third one look very sophomoric. And your hundredth one will make your tenth one look quaint. I mean, you get my point I'm trying to make? Like, mm -hmm. just do it. Just get it done. No one cares. Just get it done. Is that book almost alchemy related to this? That's what, why you mentioned it? Almost alchemy describes an ascension model. So not quite this. If this product itself is just the... First of all, game. everyone should read Almost Alchemy. It's an awesome book on marketing and okay. mindset and business entrepreneurialism and mindset. And it's a great book. I okay. just, it's a great book to recommend. But that particular chapter describes ascension... The, the concept of ascension, but you don't need to study it. Just do what I just told you to do. Okay. I could give you 10 books to read to learn how to do all this stuff, but if you'll just do what I just asked you to do, you'll start getting results. Okay. Thank you.
All right? All right? Hey, Stephen Williams again with Flagstrap Family Law, where we help parents and relatives stand up for themselves in child custody cases. Um, one thing we started doing was Zoom consultations. I'm sure a lot of people have said that. Um, but sort of following that rabbit hole, um, that enabled us to do a lot more Saturday consultations because, you know, I could just go to my office at the house and pick up an extra, not that I was in there all day, but pick up an extra two or three consultations a week um, on Saturdays without having to go to too much trouble. And, you know, that adds up over time, so that, that was good. Um, to kind of lead to the question, um, the court system stopped doing jury trials, so the courts focused on family law, which we had an associate at the time who just turned out not to have it. And because the court system focused on 100% family law cases, that exposed this associate who probably could have skated by, you know, another six months on not, you know, meeting the bar and meeting the standard at, at, of a member of our team. So we were able to get rid of, we were able to terminate her employment um, a lot sooner than we would have, which created a gap in our legal operations that I had to step back from sales to fill and, and pick up more of the legal work than I was doing at the time, so, which has made it imperative that Thomas and I, my CEO, work together to get a dragon in the next few months, um, which to your 2022 plan, we get the dragon, that takes over the sales, then down the road we hire the associate that takes back over for the legal work, and now in 2022 we're that much better off because we had to make these hires because of the pandemic. Um, my question is the individual that I would consider bringing in for an interview as a dragon, she, she currently sells cars, which I know I, I, you've said in the past that you like people that sell stuff, you know, that, that you can't like tweak the product, you just sell it or you don't. Um, she is a good friend of mine, uh, personally, and if, uh, you know, just any, any tips or cautionary tales, she's a friend, you know, bringing in this dragon or, or taking her through the process, caution, focus on this, focus on that, when hiring the dragon, because that's where we're at. Um, before we talk about the dragon, can we just talk about when are you going to hire two associates? Well, I, I, I want to hire an associate later this year, but I just don't think the lawyer's the next hire. I think the, lawyer, the next lawyer comes after the dragon or the paralegal, which we're in the market for both the dragon and the paralegal right now. So those are the first two spots, and then a lawyer would be down the road. Could be three months, could are be six. Are you the only lawyer in the firm? No, we have three lawyers. So why did you have to go back into doing the legal work when you lost that lawyer? Because the other two lawyers are almost at capacity. Now we're able you to. Said, you said the other three are almost at capacity. No, the. You're the third lawyer. I'm the third lawyer. Yes, Got sir. It. April Jones. Yes. Hi. What does he need to do? He needs to hire a lawyer. How many? <laughs> Two. Thank you. You need to hire two associates, stat. Why two? Because if I fired one, you know, why do I need two? And why do I need the lawyers before the dragon? Um, <laughs> hire two because there's a chance one won't work out. Okay. It's a pretty good chance. Hire two because... It's the same trouble to, to train and onboard two of them as to train and onboard one of them. And then you only have to go through it once. 
hire two because they'll keep each other more honest. And you'll see if they're both performing like this or if one of them, or they're performing like this. You get what I'm saying? Yes. And hire two because if you're going to grow your firm, if you're telling me that the other two lawyers are so busy that when you lost a third, you got dragged back into doing a whole bunch of legal work yourself, that tells me that this thing is redlining to begin with and you really need to switch gears and hire another attorney. Or, or really look at the capacity of the other two lawyers and, and, and really maybe find out how real that is. And or do that too. Right, we'll yes. do both. You, you, need, you need more lawyer work in your firm. Whether it's more lawyer work because you find more capacity within the two lawyers you've already got, or more lawyer work by hiring more lawyers, I think hiring a dragon and leaving yourself in the role of production is not the right answer. That's... Okay. I, I fully appreciate that hiring the dragon while you do the legal work, like I get that that makes sense. It just makes sense in a different way than the way I'm looking at it. Right. Um, changing subjects, how to hire a friend to be a dragon. That's really your question. How do I hire this person who's a friend without it risking the friendship? Yes. All right. Uh, number one, it does risk the friendship. Or let me rephrase that. It risks the illusion of friendship. If it's a real friendship, then there's no risk. If it's not a real friendship, you might discover that and it might hurt your feelings. Can you accept that premise? Yes. Okay. Um, have you sat down with this person and said, I want to hire you and I want to talk about how we're going to manage our business relationship and our friendship? Are you romantically involved? No. Okay. And we're, and we're not that far into the discussion. It was just, hey, would you, would you be interested in coming in for an interview on this? Yeah, that sounds awesome. And then that's how, that's how far we are. So would you be interested in coming in for an interview? Um, to the extent that you respect the friendship and want to protect the friendship, you have to be like brutally, ruthlessly vulnerable and honest. Like, let me tell you all the bad stuff about this job. Let me tell you all the bad stuff about working with me. Let me tell you about all the bad, like, just complete, vulnerable transparency. And that way, if she takes the job, there's no surprises. And if she takes the job and she doesn't like what she finds, you don't have to worry that you misled her. You told her the truth. You get what I'm saying? Right. Now, if you tell her the truth, the whole truth, but nothing but the truth, and you're transparent, and you lay it all out there, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and she takes the job, and then she is angry, upset, pissed off, I mean, what else could you do, right? right? Um, that's one thing. Second thing, is she currently working? Yes, she currently sells cars. So I would ask her to maybe try the job part-time for a while and say, look, I want to give you a chance to really try this out. And 
you're already making sales on weekends and she probably doesn't work every single day during the week. I don't imagine there's a lot of car sales taking place on Mondays. Um, and say to her, look, I, I, on your days off, without risking your current job, nights, weekends, come in and try it out and see how you like it. And let's see how we work together and let's see what we can do. Um, so, you know, you take it slow and You've been through Dragon Training. Well, I mean, I've done the, I've done the sales workshop myself, right. but not with a dragon. Okay, well, the point I'm making is you can teach her how to sell your way. Right. Right, so she can, you can teach her. You can share the recordings from the live quarterly meetings. Um, you can have her come in and observe you. Um, you can then observe her. And we actually record our initial consultations with our prospective client's permission so Ask she can go to school on that. There you go. So just develop a really intentional, deliberate onboarding plan, which, by the way, is how you should handle it with every salesperson you ever hire. Right. That, that's very helpful in... To sum it up, the priority, though, would be the lawyers to get operations back up. In my opinion, you need lawyers before you need salespeople. 10-4, copy, thanks. And April Jones thinks you need all of it at the same time. Yes. Could you just go to the microphone, please? The people in Zoom can't. And we're going to go to Zoom, so let's, let's pick someone off of Zoom. <clears throat> this is referring to his question. If you, you keep saying hire two attorneys, yes. but what if the bank account, the firm bank account, only allows you to hire one attorney? How do you bridge that gap, I guess? How much do you think it costs to hire a $80,000? How, how much do you think you're going to pay for each attorney? Just, just tell me. Yeah, $85,000. $85, mm -hmm. um, I'm using my phone. How much, uh, my calculator, how much do you think it costs to hire an $85,000 attorney? How much does it cost? $85,000, I guess, a year, right? No. I mean, nothing at first. That's right. So you're saying your bank account can't afford nothing? Well, eventually you're going to have to pay them a paycheck, right? So how much do you think it costs to hire an $85,000 attorney? Well, to hire them initially, nothing. And then? But then you have to pay them. Do you? Yes. I don't pay anyone. Well, your company. Mm, no. Julie? Julia, yes. Do I pay you? Julie gets paid. Not by my company. Mm -hmm. Oh, by her. She pays herself is what you're saying. She pays for herself. Yeah, yeah. See, the way that you, I would encourage you to think about your relationship with your employees. And by the way. But does this happen right away? I mean, usually there's like a training period. and. So how long does it take you to. I mean, sometimes it takes so, so how long, how long, does it, how long should it take an associate to break even? I mean, in a perfect world, day one, right? Well, no, that's not a perfect world. That's a fantasy world. In a perfect real world, how long should it take an associate to realistically at least break even? A month? A month and a half? Okay. So how, long does, so how much does it really cost to hire that $85,000 person? I'll do some math for you. $85,000, right? times 1.20 is $102,000. We gross it up for benefits and taxes. 102 divided by 52 weeks is $1,961 a week times how many weeks should it take that associate to at least break even if you do proper onboarding and proper training? Let's say six weeks. Mm -hmm. So $1,961 a week times six weeks 
It's $11,769. So $11,000 is what it costs you for that associate to get them to break even. They got $11,000 of runway that you're willing to give them. Now, that associate should bill how much per year? Do you bill by the hour in your firm? Oh, well, my husband. I'm actually not an attorney. I work with my husband's okay. firm well, over there. Does, but does, does the firm bill by the hour? Uh, we have clients that we bill by the hour, and the, we also have a PI side, so it's, it's like a two-prong approach. Okay, so what's the average PI case worth? Jason? Let's just go with let's just go with let's just go with hourly. What's your average bill? What were you billing the associate at? Two ninety five. All right. So two hundred ninety five dollars an hour times forty six weeks a year times let's say thirty hours a week. Is that reasonable? Times thirty hours a week. So for an eleven thousand dollar investment, you're going to have four hundred thousand dollars in revenue. Would anyone like to make an investment of eleven thousand dollars to get back four hundred thousand dollars? Definitely. Well, then you know. Okay, so that's your theory. Just hire two at once. Okay. Well, I'm saying hire two at once because it's the same trouble to recruit two at the same time. You ever have a cat? Mm-hmm. You ever have a cat? Yes. You ever have two cats? No. Anyone have two cats? Is it more trouble to have one cat or more trouble to have two cats? It's more trouble to have one cat. Two cats are easier than one cat. It's kind of like kids too, right? <laughs> I only have one kid, so yeah, I, I think three, so. got three, so. There you go. Now, if you start getting the three cats, that's a different issue. You become a cat lady. Okay, great, thank you. All right, sorry for the detour. Who is on Zoom? Hillary Walsh. Hillary Walsh. Hillary Walsh. Oh, I can hear myself. It's so strange. There's like an echo. We hear you. Hi, R. John Robbins. I'm Hillary Walsh, and I own an immigration law firm in Phoenix, Arizona. All right. So something the pandemic forced you to start doing, stop doing, and then what's the question? It forced me to start doing virtual meetings. It first it forced me to work from home and do non in person meetings. Um, and the problem is, I have two problems for you. I want to continue. Our, our close, and you want to our, continue, and you want to continue doing well, that even after the pandemic I, is over. I want to continue doing virtual meetings because then we can have talent. We can have talented non attorney salespeople all over the world doing these consultations rather than Hillary Walsh in the office in Phoenix, Arizona. Bingo. Bingo. Okay. And what the pandemic forced you to stop doing that you want to keep not doing? You don't want to go back to it doing? Forced, yeah, I don't want to go back to doing consultations full time because that's what I've been doing. And it really wasn't necessarily the pandemic that did that. It was also health issues, but all, overall, I don't want to go back. I've, I've on the other side of things and I'm looking at the, the future and I, I don't want to go back to Hillary Walsh being the primary salesperson in this law, in this business. Beautiful. Okay. So what's the question? So my, our conversion rates for virtual meetings is significantly lower. So we have like a 20 to 30% higher rate compared to 60 to 80% when it's in office. And this is during the pandemic and everything. So the the one thing that I can really get at um, that's like a limiting factor is they're not in the office. And it's, I think if the, the two things that I, I see happen is the most of my clients pay in cash. So when they when I can talk to them and ask them, what do you have today? So we can get started working on your case immediately. And they say they have a thousand dollars in cash, then they're going to put that cash on the table and they're going to hire. But if they're in Zoom, obviously we can't do that. Oh, I got to go to the bank tomorrow to deposit that money because I don't have it on my card. So then the conversation kind of fizzles out because we can't move forward because they don't have any cash to put down right then. And this is a pretty consistent, I guess, objection. The other so one they're, is they're not saying that 
they, they're not saying, I don't want to hire you. There's logistical things that prevent them from hiring you. And if they don't hire you then and there, it sort of like fizzles out. Exactly. Okay. So I, I can help you solve this problem. Our, these are clients are, they're obviously all in, in Arizona, right? No, these are clients across the U.S. I do a lot of marketing in Kansas but, and then Arizona. But, but you said that they usually have cash and they hand you the cash. So, yeah, if, if I'm doing a if I'm doing in person consultations, then we ask people for what cash do you have right now so we can get started. And let, then let's right divide let's divide the problem in two, and and they're two different issues with two different solutions. Okay. All right, so just role play with me and it'll be easier than explaining it, all right? So you'll be the client and I'll be your dragon, all right? So blah, 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 you want to hire us? And your answer is yes. Yes. Great. Yes. Uh, how much cash, you know, how much have you got to get started with? No, I don't have any cash. I'm sorry. Well, I, I have, I have cash. I have, um, I have a thousand dollars. Okay. Terrific. Uh, where are you located? I'm in garden city, Kansas. No, no, this is the person who's in Arizona. We're talking about. Oh, okay. Um, are we doing this consultation? We're, separa we're right separating now? the problem. <laughs> we're separating the issue between the locals and the non-locals. Let's solve the locals first. All right. Okay. So, so the locals so, who were doing so a virtual meeting, I'm in, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Great. Um, I will pass by your house tonight. I'll pass by your house tomorrow morning and I'll bring the paperwork and I'll pick up the payment and we'll get started. We can do, do I want to send a, a we can do this as do a I want to send a female Sorry? employee to someone's house? Do I want to send a female employee? I mean, I, I, this is this is pulling up all these objections in my my Hillary Walsh mind, not the client mind. That'll work, but like if I send my employee to someone's house, what happens if I don't know? This is my right. subconscious, I guess, throwing up red flags. By the office. How's that? Yeah, they, they say that that's what they'll do or that they're going to go by the bank and pay by card. You don't have to but go if, by the bank we and don't... pay by card. I'm trying to, I'm trying to eliminate the, the obstacles here. The, the, the first scenario is a scenario where the person is local, they've got cash, they want to hire you, but the logistics of getting the cash to you through a traditional banking system is a problem for them because they're illegal and they don't have relationships with banks. And most of their banking is done at liquor stores and pawn shops. And they don't really operate in a traditional banking environment. And so just have them bring the cash to you at the office. Now that you've chosen to hire us, bring the cash by We'll have the documents for you to sign and just drop off the cash, pick up your papers and away we go. That's they, they will agree to that, but then they don't do it. Which is why I want to say, let's send someone to the office. Okay. And, uh, you can, you can say, we will send someone to your uh, we'll send someone to pick up the cash and drop off the paperwork for you. This someone doesn't necessarily have to be the salesperson. The someone could be a. I'm trying to say this in a politically correct way because this is being recorded. So I'm just going to say a person who's comfortable going to pick up cash and drop off paperwork. Hire an off-duty, hire a former sheriff. Uh, I don't know. Okay, I, I get the vein you're, you're poking around in. Okay. I, I can't hear you. Right? Um, 
I, I, I didn't hear you. I said, okay, I understand. Well, I'm, 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 I'm solving one part of the problem for you, and then we'll chip away, and then we'll solve the next part of the problem for you. But the first part of the problem for you is they've got cash, they want to hire you, they don't have access to traditional banking channels. It's confusing, it's intimidating, it's complicated for them to get the cash from their pocket to your hands. And I'm saying the quickest, easiest, most expedient way to solve this problem is send someone to retrieve the cash from them that same day. Uh, personal injury lawyers all have investigators who go to all kinds of different, all the personal injury lawyers in the room are all raising their hands or raising their thumbs. The, you can hire an investigator, and an investigator is a person who's probably former military, former law enforcement. I don't know how to say it's more, polite, more correct. They carry a gun, and they walk around at the sketchy places all the time, all right? And they're not going to have a problem going to someone and saying, give me $1,000 in cash and exchanging paperwork. And you know what? If it costs you 100 bucks as a transaction fee to get hired, so what is the cost of doing business? That's number one. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Just go faster. Don't mosey. That's, that's as fast as you get. Is it? That is as fast. Man. The problem is, it, and we do a bankruptcy practice, the problem is these people don't have the cash to start with. No, 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 that's not the scenario. The scenario is they've got the cash. They say they've got the cash. Well, that's a different problem. But let's not solve a different problem than the one she presented. Okay, but they're on virtual. So by the time you get them off the virtual, their problem is off their, their mind. So somehow when they get on virtual, what I was on, trying to drive... On, you're, you're making up new facts that okay. aren't part of the fact pattern. The fact okay. pattern is they've got right. the cash... They say, I want to hire you. They don't know how to get the cash to her. And the solution is send someone to get the cash. Now we have, we can solve a different problem, but that's how you solve that problem. Okay. I understand. Okay. How do you get them to, before they go on virtual, to somehow get the money or some portion of the money to you? That's a different, that's a completely different problem than the question she asked. So Hillary's first problem is, the person who has the cash and doesn't know how to transmit the cash to her. All right? And they're local. Hillary, now you've got a second problem. And the, 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 the second problem is the person who's not local, right? Mm -hmm. And they've got the cash. Now, when you say these people are coming to you from all over the place, are they really coming to you from all over the place, or are they mostly coming to you from a few different remote places? A few different remote places, specifically Great. where we're marketing. Sorry? Specifically where we're marketing. We do a lot of Facebook marketing, so it's very, it's very predictable where people are coming to me from. So, for example, a whole bunch of people are coming to you from Kansas City because that's where you used to live. Correct. Great. So you hire an investigator in Kansas City who goes to pick up the cash and gives them the paperwork. Same thing, same exact thing, except the, except the investigator lives in Kansas City and you email the person, you say, here's the paperwork that you're gonna drop off, get signed, pick up the cash, bring it back to me, pay me the thousand dollars you collect minus your fee and, and that's how you do it. Okay. It's a lot less expensive doing that than opening up a new office in Kansas City. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All right. Are those your two problems, or is there now a third, pro third variation of that same problem? Well, the, the variation is that a lot of my clients are victims of some form of abuse or control by their U.S. citizen spouse. And so they're, we're trying to help them get their green card by using this abuse as something that's gonna help them with the immigration process. So we, we can't let their spouse know about this or it's gonna put them in danger. So that's the only other wrinkle of the idea of sending someone to their home. Um, are, they, are they, and I'm not saying this rhetorically, are they under such 
control and confinement that they can't leave their home? Can they go to the grocery store? Can they go to the dry cleaner? Can they, are they, are they, are they able to leave the home? Yes, most of the time. Great. Well, my investigator will meet you at this safe place. Okay. Yeah, it seems like I should just get a Regis office and then rent it by the hour or something, and that's where they meet. But that still forces the person. My investigator will meet you at a bank, and then I don't have to pay for a Regis office. Yeah. My investigator will meet you at a hospital, and then I don't have to pay for a Regis office. Okay. I see. Thank you. My investigator will meet you at the bank. And then the investigator deposits the money directly in your bank account. Okay. I'll give it a go. You get what I'm saying? I mean, they're not afraid to go to a bank. They're intimidated by banks. They don't have a banking account, and they're unfamiliar with how banks work, and they're intimidated by banks. But if you say to them, you're going to go to this bank at this address, at this location, at this time, you're going to meet my investigator. My investigator is going to take you inside the bank. You're going to sign the paperwork, and you're going to hand the cash to the investigator. And the investigator is going to, going to deposit the cash into my bank account. And instant presto, I'm paid. You're now represented. Investigator facilitates the whole thing for you. Okay. I'll give it a try. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. The, the problem that you're describing, I don't know your name. I'm sorry. Mike, the problem you're describing is a, is a different issue. That's not the problem that Hillary's got. Hillary's clients have the cash. They will pay her the cash. They're willing, they're ready, willing, they're simply unable to physically transmit the cash to her because of distance or, uh, well, distance. That, that's why they can't give her the cash. Uh, okay. Hi, R. John, Nancy Adkins, Adkins Family Law. Um, we help first responders in unhappy marriages find their freedom. Cash App, Venmo, and Zelle are wonderful ways to get cash from clients remotely. Um, one of the things that I stopped doing um, during the pandemic is I was limiting my sales calls to 15 minutes. And one of the things I was able to do because we were working remotely is increase that call time. So the call time is now 40 minutes. One of the things that it's led me to do is to develop more of a relationship with the prospective client um, and to begin to ask them questions. So I'm getting a lot of that useful information about what I'm doing versus what other attorneys are not doing, such as lowering the incoming retainer. So I used to start at 2,500, now I'll take 1,500 or 1,000 and put them on a payment plan because other attorneys will not do that. Um, I'm also finding out information in terms of us calling or you know following up with them. I'm not interested in closing right. the deal. So, so to summarize it, just to, so we move forward because I don't want to mm -hmm. run out of time. By, by spending, by, by investing more, by, by I, you stopped creating an arbitrary time limit on your sales calls. You then discovered that by having more time with the prospective client, you could have a more meaningful conversation, which actually increased your conversion rate. And I bet it also increases your referrals on the back end, too. It's done both. It's going to do a lot of other good things for you, too. Okay, it great. Has. So, what's so the, the problem is, the problem? I've, I, can't, I, I can't get to all the calls, um, which is April a great, Jones. great so, I'm sorry, opportunity, opportunity. Get another. April Jones. I'm looking for an attorney. April yeah, Jones. Yeah, I'm looking for an attorney. Hi, April. How much, what does she need to do? He needs a, he needs a hire. He needs to hire a dragon. How many, how many dragons? Two. There you go. <laughs> hire two dragons. I'm serious. Hire two dragons. Okay, two dragons, and I'm already looking for an attorney because I am the attorney in the practice. Hire two so. lawyers. Two lawyers, two dragons, go. Love go. it. Thanks, guys. Right? Yeah. Just do it. <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm really serious. Chances are one of the dragons isn't going to work. Chances are one of the lawyers isn't going to work. Recruiting them is a giant pain in the ass. Go through it once, not twice. Recruiting two people is the same hassle as recruiting one at the same time. 
onboarding two people at the same time is just the same, it's the same pain in the ass as onboarding one of them at the same time. And onboarding two of them is actually in many ways easier because they keep each other honest. Because you're going to give them a lot of self-study and a lot of self-paced work and a lot of self-paced stuff to do. And when one of them is doing it and the other one doesn't do it, the one who's not doing it is like, shit, I better get my act together because the other one's making me look bad and they actually up each other's game. Thank you. And if you're so unfortunate as to find two dragons that work out and find two associates who are so great that they work out that you're in the enviable position of, oh my God, I got too many great people working for me. What will happen is you'll just turn up your marketing and your firm will quadruple. And where do I get those attorneys and staff from? That's a different question. It's oh, a whole different, different conversation. <laughs> it's a whole, no, seriously, it's a whole different conversation, but strategically, that's what, listen, April, the reason I keep going to April is because April has been like, April has been to almost every single mindset, sales training, cash flow, uh, financial literacy. She's been to like every single workshop that we've offered since the day she joined. Am I right? April? Hang on, April? I've been, to a, I've been to a lot. I have a lot of notes. Right. And, and, and where was your firm then and where is your firm now? I um, had a gigantic AR problem and, um, and I was doing all the sales and it was crazy. Um, I had a huge fight at Disneyland for one of the, Disney World at one of the, uh, one of my workshops with my husband because I was just like on the log gym answering all these questions. It was awful. And now I um, have a whole, I have a sales team. I'm putting together a marketing team. I've got eight attorneys and um, well, it's 17, 18 of us and I don't have any clients. And where were your revenues like three years ago or four years ago? Uh, seven something, then they're uh, two, four and my run rate is like a three, one or two run rate. So she's got a four million. So she grew her firm from seven hundred thousand dollars to basically four and a half million dollars in thirty six months, because she just went all in, and I'm. It like became like a little joke because like literally every time she was at a workshop, she's like, "What do I need to do?" I'm like, "You need to hire two more of this. You need to hire two more of that. You need to." And every time she did it, surprise, surprise, I actually knew what the fuck I'm talking about, and it worked. All right, so in fairness to April, you had your hand up, so you'll go next since you're here. Okay. She's on mute, I, you're on, there you are. I actually, this isn't my question, but I actually found this post-it that you sign. It's like a giant piece of paper that you stick to the wall. It was, I think, in the sales training and you scribbled out how I could make $3 million and then you signed it and it's dated. I just found it and put it on my wall like two days ago. It's on your wall? It's on my wall in my office. Can you show it to us? Yeah, in my home office. Why isn't it framed? Aha. Well, I just went and unfolded it. Framing will come later. Do you recognize your own handwriting or not? Yeah, May 3rd, 2019, sales lab. Yeah, and somewhere on here is three million. Three million. Three million, and then all this is your like, you figured out an attorney pays four fifty five, and then the lawyer paralegals make this much, and then you you made these little pods, and then you did the math, and I thought that was so crazy that um, I asked you to sign it, and I kept it. And I love it. And, and now it's. And it's not nothing. And now you got a $4 million firm. Yeah, yeah. It's, now it just makes perfect sense. But at the time, it was like, ooh. Yeah. And I had just joined and, and got, I just had a new credit card. So I just uh, did the workshops and crossed my fingers. OK. All right, what's the question? OK, so I talked to my sales team. One of our problems is. Uh, 
what Heidi was just talking about, where closing isn't as easy over the phone, and that um, it, but they feel like people use the excuses to get off the phone that they can't use if they're in person, like, oh, my husband's calling or whatever, and they're having trouble closing the sales that way, and also that people are just trying to get free legal advice and they could do it easily, again, over the phone. So it's right. the switch to virtual problem. So, so your question is how to deal with those issues? Yes. Okay. I feel like we're not getting, I mean, I know we've maxed, we've gotten, we've hit our most consults and closings ever, but I, I was planning for, um, to add like two every other month, like Erica said in some workshop I went to. We might be doing that, right. but we go so, back. So just in the interest of time, let me just summarize this. Okay. Right. Issue one is you've got people who are saying, I'm sorry, I have to get off the call. Yes. Okay. So I wonder if your salesperson is doing a good enough job at the opening of confirming the time. Before we get started, I just want, is this a good time to speak? When we, when we originally scheduled this appointment, we booked it for an hour, 30 minutes, two hours, whatever it is. Does that time still work for you? Person says, yes, it does. Take them at their word. And if they say, oh, I'm really sorry, I got I to gotta get off the call because my so-and-so is calling me, you could say, okay, um, we originally had this appointment booked for an hour. Do you want me to hold, take care of that call and come back? Or should I call you back in 20 minutes? Because mm. we booked this time for an hour. Issue two. Um, um, issue, so, so let me say about that first part. <clears throat> When someone says something like that in a sales call, I think what tends to happen is we make a bunch of assumptions. It, it, it tends to get us triggered and we immediately start jumping to making assumptions about things and then we make up stories. And sometimes we miss the obvious answer, which is maybe it's true. And so what I do when someone says something like that is I take them at their word. I assume that what they said was true when we agreed that an hour was going to work. I assume that uh, what they're saying is true when they say that their kitchen's on fire or their husband is calling or whatever the reason is. And I work with them around that problem. Now, you know, what you might find is that it hurts your feelings because eventually you get them cornered and they say, no, the truth of the matter is I just want to get off the phone with you. They won't actually say that, but you know, worse to that effect. But assume that what they're saying is true and work around the problem with them. You get what I'm saying? Yes. All right. Next is they're getting on the phone just to get a bunch of free advice, right? Yes. Give the free advice to them for free before they get on the phone with you in your pre engagement glide path. <coughs> so if they're getting on the phone to get free advice, they're always asking for the same free advice, right? I mean, there's like, what, 10 questions that they always ask to try to get free advice out of you from? Yes. So yes. in your, in your pre-engagement glide path, you say in preparation for our appointment scheduled for Thursday at three o'clock or whatever it's going to be, uh, we've prepared this video for you. We've prepared this list of frequently asked questions for you. We've pre prepared this uh, audio recording for you to answer some of the frequently asked questions. And that knocks out all of the free, and like, here's all the free advice that everyone asks for, and you just give it to them generously, graciously, enthusiastically. And that way, when they get on, you know, and what you'll find is a lot of people who just wanted the free advice, they're going to cancel the appointment. They're not going to show for the appointment, right? And yeah. one of the questions that they all want to know is, come on, we all know the answer, was it going to cost? So right. you tell them what's going to cost. That's that's a question. It's a legitimate question, right? One of the pieces, of, one of the things people always want to know is what's it going to cost. Well, the answer is we don't know what's going to cost. We do, because we don't know what your exact situation is until after 
you've engaged our services, and we don't know what your ex is going to do, and we don't know who your ex is going to hire, and we don't know what judge is going to be assigned to, and we don't know this, and we don't know that. And any lawyer who tells you what it's going to cost, any family law attorney who tells you what it's going to cost before they know this stuff, they're lying to you. And if you hire any family law attorney and you ask them what it's going to cost, which is a completely legitimate question, and it's, I would want to know the answer to that too, but any family law attorney who tells you what it's going to cost before they know all this information, they're lying to you, and if you want to hire a lawyer when you know they're lying to you right up front, please cancel the appointment with us because we're not the right law firm for you. And can I use my um, four videos a month I have in my Jimbo program to make those videos? Shout out Jimbo. Ab absolutely, you can. What is Thanks. this, that Jimbo thing you speak of? Every Thursday, I mean, the first Thursday of the month, I make four videos, professional videos of whatever topic, and then um, Jimbo sends them out to it. Is it so hard I to produce these four videos every Thursday? No, every Thursday of the month? No, even if I don't want to, I do it anyway because it's scheduled. It's every Thursday, the first Thursday of the month. And no, it's is not it, hard. Is it fun? It's fun once I get after it. Sometimes I feel busy, but if, and I would never have made them if I didn't have the appointment. And then it gets fun. Is it convenient? It's super convenient. I just sit here, turn on my lights. It is, I have to have eyelashes or not. Sometimes I just say, forget it. But other than that, yep. Do they make it easy for you? Super easy. They even review the script that my dragon sends over, and then I just read it if I want. Have you found these Jimbo videos to be profitable? I have found them to be profitable. I even have my dragons have made videos where they say whatever they say to people. Hi, I'm Emily, blah, blah, blah. So they're fun. They're convenient. Yes. They're easy, they're profitable, and oh, by the way, you could try the first one for free. Yes, and no, I no, let's not do that. <laughs> I'm not. I'm making the point to everyone who has not signed up for their free test drive, which you can do so by going to some place that Jimbo's going to run to the back of the room and tell Renee to put into the chat. How are you not already moving? Go, Jimbo, go. Go, go, go. And by the way, we're going to stop taking free test drives um, pretty soon for a few months. So we only have a limited number of free test drives. They're free. All right. Thank Does you. Does that answer your question? Yes, it answers my question. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Did you put her up to that? That was so perfect. That was awesome. Thank you. I don't know who that is. I can't see with the lights. Sean Henriksen. Oh, hi, Sean. How's it going? So one thing that I've changed uh, since the pandemic was I, st I used to do all of my consultations uh, in person. I switched to doing them over the phone and over Zoom also. Right. And I plan to continue doing that. Sometimes it's quicker and easier. And then since I do criminal defense, I've got a lot of people who are looking for answers quickly. So I plan on continuing that. My problem is that when I do the consultation, I go through with them beforehand, before we start, let them know the agenda about, you know, we're going to talk about them and then we're going to talk about what brings them in today and, and kind of go through the process and get their okay on that. But a lot of times I get people asking early on about how much it's going to cost and they're, they'll ask before I have a chance to find out how this is how what they're being charged with is going to affect them and how I can provide value. Remind me what your firm does. We do criminal defense. And they want to know what it's going to cost. Right. Do you have any kind of pre-engagement glide path? Yes. But if I'm doing a consultation quickly or so what I have is I've got an email list that goes out. So once I get their information and schedule a consultation, a All right, so let me just divide the question into two parts. Sure. I think I'm hearing two different questions. I think one question is they, one question, one scenario is we have the opportunity to send them things in a pre-engagement glide path. 
And the other scenario is we don't have the opportunity to send them information in a pre-engagement glide path. Is that correct? That is correct, but in both circumstances, I'll still have people asking this, how much is it going to cost? I understand that. But okay, they, but yes, but, yes, but, they, but the solutions are different. Right, right. right? So the, where, where you have the opportunity to send them things in a pre-engagement glide path, address that question in the pre-engagement glide path. And do I just, so I know that you, in the last question, you were talking about family law and, and they don't really know. I know pretty much up front. I mean, I can tell pretty quickly. I, I'm, I focus mainly on misdemeanor assault cases. So I know what I'm going to charge them already. I know how much it's going to cost. And do I just tell them this is what it's going to cost? You know, in, in this that is exactly why I like to hire salespeople who have sold things. Right? Right. When I go to the pen store, the price of the marker is the price of the marker. It's $2. The clerk does not have the opportunity to negotiate the price. They can only justify it. They can only tell me the value of it but they can't change it. You understand what I'm saying? I do. And this is what I don't like about hiring salespeople who have never sold things like this, who have only ever sold intangibles because they're always trying to change and negotiate the price. So if what you're telling me is that the price of a misdemeanor, misdemeanor is how much? 3500 It's always 3500 Right. It's never 4000 It's never 3000 It's always 3500 End of discussion. That's right. 3500 for you, 3500 for you, 3500 for you, for the two of you, for 7000 3500 right. That's it, right? That's it. Great. So tell them the price up front in the pre-engagement glide path, but explain to them the value of why 3500 with you is better value to them and a smarter decision than 2500 with the guy down the street. Don't name the guy down the street. Listen, there's a lot of lawyers out there who will do this for $2,500. I even heard of a guy doing this for $1,500. <clears throat> Let me tell you the reason why I don't think you should entrust your future to a person who's willing to do this for you for only $1,500 and explain why. Follow what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. And the end of the video or the end of the message is, look, if at the end of this, you decide that you, you, you if, if after watching this, you are like, no way, I, I want someone for only $1,500, I don't want for $3,500, blah, 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 do me a favor. Do, do us both a favor. Contact my office, tell them you saw the video, tell them you don't want me for $3,500, you want me to refer you to a $1,500 lawyer, and I will refer you to a lawyer who will do this for you for only $1,500. There's a lot of lawyers out there who will do it for only $1,500. Most of them I wouldn't trust to defend my dog. But at least if you insist on having someone for only $1,500, let me at least get you to an honest, competent, sober lawyer who would do it for you for only $1,500. They're not as experienced as me. They're not going to do all these extra things that I'm going to do. They're not going to provide all these additional services for you. But at least I know they're not out of control. At least let me refer you to, the, to, to a decent $1,500 lawyer. Okay. And some people will call you and they'll say, please make the referral. Please make the referral. Please, I mean, if you keep getting that, that's a different problem we have to solve. Right. You may have to develop a low-cost $1,500 bargain basement digital something solution. I don't know, but let's, let's not solve that problem until you discover you have it. What I suspect you're going to find is that if you do a good job of describing value of the $3,500 versus the $2,500 versus the $1,500, 
I suspect what you're going to find is most people, most of the kind of people that you want to represent are going to say, I don't want the $1,500 guy. I want you. And part of the thing you can say in this message is, listen, a lot of lawyers, you know, uh, you know, you might be surprised that I'm being this open with you and this honest with you. Well, this is one of the things you can count on when you're working with our firm is we're always going to tell you the truth. You might not like it, but we'll tell it to you so you can make an informed decision. Okay. I mean, I'm not trying to write your whole script here, but you get the idea? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, I think it'd be, uh, I like that. Now, the person who you don't have the opportunity to do the glide path with, you're basically going to do the same thing, right? Except you got to do it live. You don't get the opportunity to be efficient. Right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.